The whole cost of Vietnam, according to some analyses that I read, was $1 trillion. So Reagan has spent twice as much as was spent on the entire Vietnam episode from the early 60s to the mid-70s, simply in a military weapons buildup, and has done this without raising taxes, and has thus built up the biggest deficit in history. Without being an economist, I read and watch these things since, you know, since George Bush called it voodoo economics. Uh, the, the deficit, the rendering the United States non-competitive the way he has done, uh, and we were already headed in that direction, he has applied the same irresponsibility to economics that he's applied to breaking up the government, the Alfred Regnery syndrome, the Elliot, Elliot Abrams type of appointment. Uh, this is where his position in history, uh, as David McMichael was telling me over the phone last night, he said the next president, be he Democrat or, or Republican, is going to be a, a Herbert Hoover. Yes. He's going to preside over a gigantic collapse. Now, how big this collapse will be, nobody knows, but the damage that has been done economically, uh, 50 years, maybe we will dig ourselves out of this, out of this debt, out of the, the balance, maybe maybe and and at the other end of the line lloyd dumas you know in his his book he brought out last year the article he ran at the new york times is is a, a s slow decline or sudden collapse but his his thesis in this book is that this this madness of reaganomics when we were already not competitive has put us on the slide down and it's we're, we are sliding down and unless we dramatically reverse our, our, the arms race, essentially, the military-industrial complex control. Uh, we're going down as a, as a superpower. We'll go down into secondary uh, national status uh, if we slide, if we don't crash. So these are expensive fantasies that uh, Reagan uh, has, which also we haven't mentioned was his early desire to destroy the Soviet Union. It seems that he really had the fantasy of eradicating the evil empire. He really was pursuing the option very seriously of a nuclear weapons buildup that would enable him to carry out a first strike policy and eliminate the Soviet Union or to create such military nuclear superiority that he could dictate to the Soviet Union because they would be afraid of his military power. And I think this is also behind the Star Wars. With this flawed person, the, 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 the individual with, uh, I mean, I've, you know, I've said since 83 in my lectures, you know, pointing out his defective mind, which is, which is obvious and now so obvious that I scarcely even bother because everyone realizes <laughs> that, you know, he simply can't keep up with things. He's had this drive, this dream, this, this radical bent that would effect a revolution, but not a kind of intellect that could really weave a revolution together. Uh, but this flawed personality, apparently uh, dating back to the childhood with the, the abusive alcoholic father who, who, who could not give him an image to live up to and at the same time emasculated him with abuse. So you have Reagan's own autobiography. The theme of it is this haunting sense of, of inadequacy that has driven him all his life. And that's the theme of the book. And the title he took from one of his movies is Where's the Rest of Me? And this, you know, is, is being cited by the psychological studies that are coming out now as, as why he would have this craving for military power, you know, to be complete, to be strong. Why he could be so offended by petty world leaders like Gaddafi, uh, for example, uh, who, who, you know, would discredit themselves. Uh, you, uh, a more complete person wouldn't get involved in the arguments with them. And he has, he has continuously gotten down to the same level of petty name-calling with them, of, of, of threatening or wanting, expressing his desire to make Daniel Ortega cry uncle. And, you know, I mean, the bullying aspect of it. You would have to have someone with a, the bully syndrome, with a very inadequate personality, who would crave to make a Daniel Ortega in a poor country like Nicaragua cry uncle. And this, you know, taking it into the Reaganomics, into the Star Wars, wanting to control the world, wanting to be able to crush his enemies, it's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous combination.
does Hollywood play any role in this? Hollywood movies over the last 40 years have projected this fantasy that the world is divided into good and evil. There's us and them, the good guys, the bad guys. We're absolutely good, they're absolutely evil. They are so evil that if we don't eradicate them, just eliminate them through violence, they're gonna get us. Do you think this contributes to Reagan's mentality that he identified with these Hollywood roles and this view of the world or you think it's sort of deeper psychological roots? Oh, it's, it's all part, it's deeper psychologically, but it's also a very, it's the American syndrome in television, the cultural, uh, the game that we put on to our kids from the age of two that they watch 10 or 20 times a day on television, the little shorty uh, cartoons where you have nice, handsome, light-colored uh, hero figures, be they Transformers, you know, and Decepticons, uh, or the, the He-Man, Sheena, the Thundercats, you know, I'm, I'm into these things because of little Jonathan. Uh, but always the nice people and evil forces rising up and the nice people saying, let's all be nice, but the evil forces insisting and forcing, and then the good guy is stomping them and beating them down. But interestingly enough, to keep the syndrome going for the little kids, Skeletor, you know, never is killed. He changes form and disappears so he can come back ne the next day and do it again. Now, we brainwash our kids, uh, like I say, 10 or 20 times a day with this, the American syndrome. Nice people being put upon by evil and, and going. Would you, would you re do you realize there is a country in this hemisphere that does not permit violent shows to be shown on television for children? Nicaragua? No, it's Cuba. Cuba. Oh. Cuba. They do not permit violent kid shows on television. Mm. They believe it's psychologically unhealthy, <laughs> and we do nothing but. Mm. Uh, assuming the Democrats or even another Republican gets in next time, is how, has he done so much damage that they're unable to put it back together again? Or, as we well know, he couldn't have done it without the Democrats' collusion in the House and Senate. So just where do we go after Reagan's out? Well, this is a possible explanation of why this democratically controlled Senate is not doing a better job investigating the Iran-Contra thing. This Reagan who has bedeviled them for so many years now, they have him. All, all they have to do is start asking the questions and they can rip this thing wide apart and have him impeached and they're not interested. And my suggestion is the, the Reagan revolution is not a Republican revolution, it's the establishment's revolution. It's getting the pendulum over here and welding it shut for the benefit of the multinationals, the military-industrial complex, of which the Democrats are just as much a part as the Republicans. Now, he has supervised a tremendous arms buildup, but remember Jimmy Carter, you know, supervised a huge arms buildup, and so did Harry Truman for just a cite too, not to mention Lyndon Johnson. And Carter also presided over a tax cut, or a tax benefit for the wealthy at the expense of the middle. Indeed, and so they don't want to throw out the, the whole revolution. They don't want to sacrifice Reagan and cast the country, throw the country back into a populist mode. There's been a tremendous shift of wealth under Mr. Reagan, I'm quoting now from Chomsky's turning the tide and, and writing the shift of wealth and power to the elite at the expense of the people. Wealth and power, the political power, the, the ketchup and, and uh, relish thing in the schools, you know, just the whole rationale of society, the dynasty uh, and Dallas thing, you know, the rich, rich and glittery uh, taking over. They don't want to lose that. The satisfaction they would get out of impeaching Reagan uh, isn't worth it because they would lose his revolution, which is gains for for their 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 level, their strata of society, their power level, and their social class, and their social yeah. class. You know, the establishment, the military-industrial complex. One of the keys to understanding the Reagan administration is understanding its relationships with the religious right. Many of whose adherents are high officials in the Reagan administration, including Reagan himself. We've referred to particular sections of this Covert Action Information Bulletin. Uh, edition of, let's see, what's that? Um, number 27? Anyway, it's the latest one, I guess something like July or June. It tells all you want to know, almost all you want to know about the religious right, and it's incredible, incredible what, how, not only what some of these people believe, but how they're organized. 
among themselves and their interrelationships with the United States government and corporate America. Uh, they're not just these weirdos who, you know, hoop and holler and rant and rave on, on television. As a matter of fact, uh, according to Robertson's... Uh,